Last Thursday morning, my phone started erupting, and it was my friend Johnny, and he keeps calling me over and over again with the same problem. Like he's the only one in the world that has problems? We all have them, don't we? But you see, once the morning he gets up and gets his day started, him and Amy try to get ready and the rat race begins. And what he finds out is getting Jack and Billy and Marie ready for school and getting five breakfasts made and then rushing out the door, barely giving his wife Amy a kiss on the cheek. He realizes the challenges that he has each day. He drops the children off to school right when the phone, when the bell rings. And then he rushes into the office and he realizes he's got hundreds of emails to deal with, phones start ringing, and personnel, HR wants an answer on a personnel issue right away. We all have those same challenges, right? Each and every day, we're in kind of that rat race of where we're starting each and every day. So to me, life is like a wireless phone battery. Why a wireless phone battery? I've been in the wireless business for 22 years. And they tell you in Rule 7B to make good analogies on things that you know a lot about. So I have some experience in this area. So that analogy is, our life, we kind of feel stuck. We kind of feel like depleted, that the battery charge is not always full. So how do we create that battery charge each and every day in our life that we want to have? We've got to be that charge that we want. So when we're stuck or depleted, how do we recharge those batteries? It's kind of like, you know, if your battery's at 5% charge, how many apps can you really run? Think about it. How many apps can you run if your battery's at 5%? For the young people in the audience, they can't run their social media, right? There's a real challenge there because we can't get our social media there. But also GPS. You can't really get your GPS if you're lost and you can't find it. You for sure can't run Candy Crush Saga. So we have those challenges each and every day. But to me, the GPS is your goal producing system. That is what's important in our life because we wanna have that goal producing system that gives us that charge we have each and every day. So think about it. If your GPS does not work, hmm, you're in lost and you're in another city and you're trying to get to point B and your GPS will not work and you just wanna get back to your hotel room, what will your GPS do? You're not gonna have that capability to find where you need to go. You can't get to the soft confines of your hotel room. Instead, you may up, end up in the meatpacking district of somewhere else that you don't wanna be in a city that you don't know. So as we look at this gold producing system, we have to look at how do we put that charge in our life. To me, it's about having goals, and it's about setting those goals that we have each and every day. So when we set goals, it allows us to find the direction that we're looking for in life. As we move forward each day, we've got to find where that is. So what are those things that's most important to us? Think about it for yourself. What's the things that's most important to you? If you're a husband, if you're a spouse, if you're a family member, you have others that you care for, love and cherish each and every day. Do we take the time for those individuals? Do we create that time that we need to have with them? So what is that for you in your life? If you're young and you're looking at all the great things you can do with your life and everything that's open to you, what do you want those doors to be? How are you gonna create that system for yourself? So as we look at that low battery charge in our life, how can we give ourselves that charge? I wanna share with you a story that happened to me when I was in the seventh grade. I was coming, we were coming home, my mom and dad and myself and my best friend Randy. And we were leaving the football game and we decided to take the new stretch of highway that opened that day. It had nice, long, straight stretches and it's supposed to be a safer road, less hills. 
as we were coming across the bridge, I could see two sets of headlights coming at us. The next thing I noticed was, bam! A car hit us, turned us completely sideways in the front of our vehicle in our two-door brown Grand Torino was caught on fire. And when that happened, I knew we had to get out of the car. I started yelling and said, we've got to get out of here. My mom and dad came too. And they said, we've got to get the doors open. We started kicking, screaming, we've got to get out of here. Finally, there was two men that came up and said, we're here to help. We want to help you. They started trying to pull the door open. It was so hot from the flames in the front of the vehicle that they said, we've got to go back and get something to be able to grab the door to be able to hold on to the door. It's too hot. When the man came back, he said, I heard him whisper real quietly. He said, we've got to get him out of here before it blows. That door opened. I don't know how, but it made me believe now in miracles because I truly believe it was a miracle that the door opened. And when that door opened, the, two, the men got us out, took us behind a truck, and kind of was protecting us from the flame of the vehicle. The only problem was they didn't realize my best friend Randy was still in the vehicle and crammed way underneath the back seat of the car. I started yelling at the men, Randy's still in the vehicle, we've gotta go back, we've gotta get him. They went back in. He was unconscious at the time, but they knew with the burning flames, they had to get him out of the vehicle. And they pulled him out of the vehicle. I'll be honest, I don't remember much from that point forward. That night was a complete fog. But I remember at the hospital, the doctor saying something to my sister, saying, I don't know how your brother ever got out of that accident without even a scratch on him. The next day, I go, we go up and see my mom and my friend Randy, because they were in University Hospital 30 miles away. My mom had third degree burns on the side of her shoulder and on the side of her face, and my friend Randy was in a coma. As I went and talked to his family, I felt guilty, because I had no injuries whatsoever. And they were wondering if he would even live. as I sat there looking at my friend Randy through the window and wondering if he would live, I felt like this guilty conscience of why? Why did this happen? What was the purpose of it? I didn't know at the time. I left, went to a bathroom and just started crying. As I came back and we left that day, I realized something has changed in me. I realized at that moment in time that something has changed. That next Monday, I go back to school like everything's supposed to be back to normal. I can tell you, I was not the same boy that left that Friday before. That Friday before, I was that carefree seventh grader just enjoying the things that happened and what life had to bring. The next four months, I will be honest with you, Sister Teresa got a totally different student. She got the troublemaker, she got the jokester, she got everything all in one package because all those nightmares, all those challenges were coming out in me each and every day. Now I remember one story, and I still wonder today how it happened because there was a duck work that took you from the seventh grade classroom and it transferred you into the library. Everybody knows what size ductwork is? I crawled in that ductwork from the seventh grade classroom to the library. Now, I still wonder, how did I fit in that ductwork? I still wonder about that. It really is kind of amazing to think that I still fit through there. But the next four months, I showed my angst through being that class clown, being that joker. Four months went past, and we were starting the second semester, coming back from January from the Christmas break, and Sister Teresa wanted to sit down with me. And she said, Gary, sit down.
So I sat down and she says, Gary, I want to know why is all this anger shown in you that you're showing in the classroom each and every day? I told her, Sister Teresa, you don't understand. I heard what those men said. They said the car was going to blow up if we didn't get out of the car. And I'm the only person in the accident that left that accident and didn't have a scratch on me. Sister Teresa said something of the nature of, Gary, why do you think the door's open? I told her, I believe in miracles now. I know they're created by our Creator. But it still made me feel that guilt. She asked me this question. She said, Gary, what do you think the purpose of your life is? Hmm, interesting. What is the purpose of my life? I will tell you, I've been spending a lifetime trying to find out what that is. And I'm trying to find out each and day, what is that purpose? But let's move from purpose to what that mindset is and share a couple things with you and play a little game. And I need you to play along with me here because I like talking about mindset because it's kind of what's set and fixed in us. So let's play a little game and you all see if you can figure it out too as we go along. Now, the goal of the game is you're supposed to think what I'm thinking. Some of you, that scares you, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My wife, I guarantee you, it scares her. Um, and stuff on that side. But think what I'm trying to think, okay? So here's the first word. Guns. Everybody got it? Got what I'm thinking? Was everybody thinking like I was? My guns! See them, boys? I just worked out this morning. Were you all thinking the same thing I was? No? Well, you don't pump iron like I do. Where's Nick? I pumped iron already this morning. See, I'm ready to go. Okay, let's try this again. Remember, the object is to think what I'm thinking. I know that's scary, but try to stay with me here. This, the object is to think what I'm thinking. The second word is, we don't have too many small children here, do we? Sex. Oh my gosh, y'all, wait a minute. Smiles went all across the faces, man. Everybody started smiling now. Now, I was just thinking male and female. You know, genders. Come on, stay with me here. Don't go there, okay? Now, let's try one more. Let's try one more and see if you can stay with me. The last word is politics. No way. I'm not going there. You know what? For speakers, that's a death trap. So there's no way I'm talking about politics on this stage, okay? I want you to listen to my message, not be mad at me about it, no matter how you feel, okay? So see, our mindset is a mental attitude, a mental inclination. It's a fixed state. It's what we believe and we see at that time. It becomes fixed over time. And it's hard to change because our mindset gets set in certain areas. And we think only a certain way about certain things because of the way our mindset is. So as we go through that, we have to decide if we have that fixed state of a mindset, how can we change it? So I want you to think about two types of mindsets that I talk about in my book. The first one is what I call the climber mindset, and the second one is the stuck mindset. So let's talk about the climber first, because this is a person that's willing to change. They're searching to learn, grow, and become who they want to be. They realize their incension in life is not where it's at, and they're always trying to find out what is that next level that I want to get to. How can I create that climber mindset? How can I make those changes that I want to to make my life become better? That's the climber, the person that's looking. They set goals. They go after what they want, and they're trying to reach it each and every day. Now you have another style of mindset. That's a stuck mindset. That person is never wanting to fail. They never want anything to change. They always want it to stay the same. Really, the past is just like the present because it's what it is today. And it's never going to be any better. They're always going to tell you why something else will work and the others won't. 
they become kind of stuck in what that mindset is. Now the question I want you to think about for yourself, which one are you today? Are you the climber or are you the person that's stuck? It doesn't matter because you can change it. And we're going to share some simple strategies for you to use that you can become the climber that you want to be in your life and in your mindset each and every day. So just give that some thought as we go forward. It's very dry up here. So let's talk about who in the room, just think about this question. Who in this room is a leader? Who in this room is a leader? I want you to think about it. Are you a leader? And after you think about that, everyone that thinks they're a leader, I want you to clap your hands. You're a leader. I thought I saw a bunch of leaders in the room. I knew you were because you came here tonight. So that was the first thing. You decided to make that challenge and that change to be able to come here. You are a leader. And I believe we are all leaders because first we're leaders of self, right? We have to lead ourselves to what we want to do each and every day and how we want to climb through life and what goals we want to achieve. So when we're a leader, we set that up. But we also show our leadership in by our daily actions, by what we do and what we decide to move forward. So we have to decide what is that for ourselves? What is the leader we want to be each and every day? Now, when we look at our leadership, remember it's first about ourself, and then it's about what we show that leadership by our actions and by what we do each and every day. So I want you to think about this as you go forward of how you are a leader in your life. When you look at that, that starts you to become who you want to be. So I want to share with you some frameworks that I have in my life. There's four frameworks that I call four practices that you can implement to be able to reach the high achievers mindset into your life each and every day. So here's how it works. The first framework that I have for you on the high achievers side of it, the first framework, first practice you have to put in play is what I call energy. Okay? Energy has two components to it. One is exercise. What do you do each day to get yourself that energy? The second area is in productivity. But let's start in the exercise area first. What are the things that we need to do each and every day to get ourselves energized to make it through each day? So let's do a little game. Everybody stand up if you would. Stand up. We're going to play a simple Simon Says game. And you have to get a little energy. You've been sitting for a while. You heard some great music by Jason and stuff. Now you've been sitting listening to me, so let's get a little energy. A quick, simple Simon Says game. Everybody remember how to play Simon Says? Whatever Simon says, you have to follow. If Simon Says doesn't say it, then don't do it, okay? Simon Says. Simon Says, don't hurt the person by you, but try to rotate your arms forward, okay? Either small circles or large circles, okay? Simon Says, rotate your arms backwards, okay? Simon Says, clap your hands. Okay, Simon says, march in place. If you can move your feet there, okay. Simon says, clap your hands, march your in place, and say it's a great day. Okay, you can sit down. Ah, oh, got some of you. Simon said, didn't say sit down. Simon says, you can sit down now. Okay, it was about half and a half, so we know where this room falls now. We know where we're kind of at. Now I will tell you on uh, 2000, November of 2003, I kind of had that change in my own mindset. I walked up to my business coach that I had for several years and I told him, I said in 2002, I told him, I said, why can't I get myself to lose this weight? At the time, I was the heaviest I'd ever been over 275 pounds. And I knew I needed to make a change. I kind of had that stuck mindset, right? But I couldn't make that change. And I asked my coach, why can't I get myself to make this change? And my coach looked at me straight in the eye and he said, Gary, when are you going to 
to stop talking about this and actually do something about it. It's like, okay, coach, gotcha. So you know what he does? He picks up the phone and he calls the fitness center and schedules me a trainer right there on the spot. And when he hangs up, he says, your appointment is next Tuesday at 6 a.m. Write it in your calendar. I scheduled it in my calendar and he said, now, you have to make your appointments on your calendar and you have to schedule your exercise session just like you do the appointments that you go to any other appointment. Do you understand? I said, yes. He said, okay. Now what you're gonna do is, the second thing that you have to do is you've gotta be accountable for your actions each and every day. I said, okay, I, I think I am like that. He said, no, you're not. You don't do it in your exercise. So now I become your accountability partner and you will become accountable to me. Okay, coach, gotcha. So I started, I set up that training session and he told me that after every time I got done with an exercise session or I scheduled one, I had to let him know. Now remember, this was before the days of text messaging. So you actually had to call. Yes, we had wireless phones then, but you still had to call to be able to give that appointment. So after I would get done with an exercise session, either he would follow up with me or I would follow up with him until it became my new mindset. He wanted to be in place there and he wanted me to make sure I knew that was the key. So as I set that up, I knew that was some of the changes that I needed to make. But as I started that accountability, what also happened, I realized there was other things I had to change in my life. Some of it was eating habits. And I had to change my daily eating habits. Does anyone here know what they call a fast food junkie? A fast food junkie is when you go to McDonald's for breakfast, and at lunchtime you throw away that trash because you're getting Taco Bell. That's called a fast food junkie. I was one of those because I was rushing in the business from one place to the other and I thought that was what I needed to do. Instead, I had to change my eating habits. I started eating more greens, vegetables, and more fruit and I realized I had to make those changes in my life each and every day. I started setting some goals for myself and as I set some of those goals, I started seeing some things happen where my weight started coming off. I started doing some of my own exercise and I made some of those changes. And with my accountability partner staying in contact with me, we kept back and forth and he kept me accountable to what I said I was gonna do. But those habits, those changes happened because they became habits. Now the key is when we start creating habits for ourselves, we have to make those changes in our life each and every day. And when we start to make those changes, they start to happen for us. So what we do is we go from exercise and we make that change, and then it's about productivity. Does anyone notice we're pretty distractible today in the world? Social media, email, all the distractions that come through us each and every day becomes a real challenge in our life. And really it's hard to be productive to get the things that you really wanna do. But we have to decide what are those changes that we wanna make. I call it a system that I call the pro. Because I think you have to become a pro. Anybody know the receiver or seen the receiver play? Jerry Rice of the San Francisco 49ers. To me, he was the ultimate pro. I read an article about Jerry Rice um, recently, and it talked about Jerry Rice, how when he started out in the league, he did the workout regimen that most people could never stay up to. And even in the latter stages of his life, he was still doing that same workout regimen. When rookies would come in the league, they would want to work out with Jerry Rice because they wanted to find out what was that secret to become a pro like Jerry Rice of the San Francisco 49ers. Jerry would always invite him out and say, come on out and work out with me. Most rookies would go out there and before they finished the workout, they would puke because they couldn't keep up with him, even when Jerry was 40 years old, because of what his regimen. One time that he was asked why 
Jerry, by a rookie, why do you still do these workouts? You're the, one of the greatest that's ever played the game. He said, that's how I became the best. I work out. I do the same things that I do each and every time. And it doesn't matter if I've made it or not. I keep doing them each and every day because he's a true pro. So if we want to become a pro in our productivity, we have to make changes in our life. So to me, pro stands for three things. The P is for peak productivity time. The R is for recovery time. And the O is for office time. So here's how the peak productivity time works. It's 60 to 90 minutes of uninterrupted time doing your most productive work. For each one of us, it's different. But for me, it's writing blogs, um, writing, scripting out things, and making my sales calls. That is most important to me. In other businesses, it's whatever your most critical item is in your business, that's your peak productivity time. And that's the only thing you do. And you block that on your schedule. And you keep it where it's sacred. And you work through that. If it's a project you're working on, Okay, you may say 60 to 90, minute, 90 minutes won't allow me to finish. You may be correct there. But the thing is, you can take that 60 to 90 minutes and then create another block time. So you find those peak productivity times. I would have never wrote that book if I didn't have peak productivity time. Because I can find a lot of other things to do than sit there and just write. You have to get into a zone to be able to write. You have to get in a zone if you're doing your peak productivity time, if you're putting out those things. So what is your zone that you need to be in that's most important to you? Now, the second one is that recovery time. That's truly enjoying our friends and family. Were you truly enjoying? With no email. I know that's hard to believe, but no email. Do you know 54% of people still check email when they're on vacation? 54% is the latest stat out of 2016 of people that check email even when they're still on vacation. Recovery time is truly enjoying your friends and family, getting a break away from the things that you need to do. And for some of it, that may be recovery time of social media. If we need to have that time, taking 24 hours away from it and truly getting recovery and allowing you to enjoy the things that you do. Now, the last area is the O, and that's office time. And office time is about setting up your peak productivity time. It's cleaning up your email. It's doing your daily tasks, having your staff meetings, all the things that you would do in business that you need to do, you still set up in office time. The only thing it's very similar to peak productivity time is you schedule that time. So whatever time that is in a day, if you need to clean up email or look at your email, do it three times a day, but have it scheduled in your office time. And when you set up those time blocks, what you start to do is you start to become a pro in managing your time and taking that time back versus just allowing every day to seem like the same. <clears throat> so we've talked about energy. Energy is about our exercise and our productivity. The second area I want to talk to you about is connections. Connections is all about our relationships. And in our relationships, we are a giver or a taker in those relationships. So what I want you to think about, who in your life are some of those relationships that's most important to you? But I want to share a story with you of a good friend of mine. I'll never forget. March 10th, 2014, I get a call from my golf partner, Keith. And he let me know that his dad had passed away the day before. I didn't realize that Lawrence was that sick, but I didn't really realize, but I told Keith I was sorry for his family and I would see him at the funeral, but I was praying for him and his family. As I was driving to the visitation, I was trying to think of the right words that I would say to Keith that would really help him feel better about the situation and the love that he had for his dad. As I seen Keith at the funeral home, I gave him a big hug, 
Keith gave me a hug and he said, Gary, I'm going to miss my dad. I told Keith, I know. I'm going to miss him too. Because you see, Keith, when we were playing unified golf together with Special Olympics, Lawrence would bring him to the course. And if I wasn't available, Lawrence would play for me. And Keith and I would always have a good time on the course, but I got to know Lawrence pretty well. And Lawrence taught me some life lessons on how to truly care for his family and truly for, care for the people that are important to you. So that night when we left the course, I don't know if I had the right words, but I felt that peace of knowing that Keith felt the presence of that relationship that him and I had together. Well, about a month later, I go to the um, after church, and Keith normally waits for me after church and always comes up and talks to me. And he says, Gary, you ready to play golf? And of course, Keith's ready to play golf just about any time. He'd probably play today if you would have let him. Okay? So he's ready to play any time. I said, sure, partner, I'm ready to play golf. He goes, we're going to win a gold medal. Well, Keith loved to win gold medals. So every year, for 12 years, I've heard him say, we've got to win a gold medal. So I said, sure, Keith, we're going to win a gold medal. He says, no, Gary, you don't understand. We're going to win a gold medal this year for my dad. Wow. Well, I felt like a ton of bricks just kind of carried on my back right there. But I said, Keith, we'll give it our best shot. But Keith does know how to get people to show up for practice. That year, I think I had my best attendance at the sessions for practicing because I wanted to win that gold medal for that goal that Keith had of winning it for his dad. I'll never forget, I'm driving up to Columbia to the regional tourney, and we just closed one of our businesses, and we're moving furniture and packing all day, and I was beat tired. But I get up there, and Keith's ready to go, and he says, Gary, are you ready to win that gold medal? And I said, sure, Keith. He says, you know why? And I said, yes, I know, Keith. We're going to win that gold medal for your dad. We got to that first hole, and I told Keith, let's say a little prayer and ask your dad to be our guardian angel today. We go out, and we're playing a pretty good round. Keith always asks, what's our score? What's our score? He always wants to know what the score is. I always tell him, we're doing great. We're doing great. Because you never know who you're competing against. So you don't know if your score is good or not. And we're playing in unified golf, so it's a bet. I shoot a shot, and then he shoots a shot. And we practice that, and we go back and forth each and every time. So we're sharing that back and forth. Well, we get done with the round. We get up there. And the uh, round is completed, and you're set up in divisions. So you're not sure exactly whose division you are. They call us up, though. And they call us, if you remember, Keith, they called us, and they put us right in the center. Well, I knew that meant we had won the gold. But Keith wasn't sure yet, because he kept asking me, Gary, did we win? Did we win? And I said, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. They named the bronze medalist. Then they named the silver medalist. And then I'll never forget this moment as long as I live. They name our names for the gold medalist. Keith looks up and said, Dad, that's for you, and makes the sign of the cross. <clears throat> it's a moment I'll never forget as long as I live. We come off the stage, and Keith says, You know what that means, Gary? I do, Keith. We got to go to the state, he says. You know what now? I want to win a gold medal for Dad at State! <laughs> Keith lets you really enjoy the fruits of your labor a long time, right? I'm thinking, wow, yes, yes, we're, we're going to give her our best shot, partner. We'll go for that gold medal at State. Well, we practice another month. We go off to State. State happens to be right here in Jefferson City, Missouri. And we go out there and we play our first, well, I get a call the day before. And the day before I get this call, and it's a reporter by the name of Nick. And Nick says, hey, I heard there's a story that you're playing for a gold medal. Your athlete is for his dad to win a gold medal for him at state. I'm like, yes, that's correct. And he said, we'd like to do a story on that. I'm like, great, that would be wonderful. 
I would love to have a video, a video guy following me around everywhere I go and taking pictures of my beautiful shots. Sure, let's do that. No, I said yes right away, and I said there's only one condition. You make sure this story is about Keith and his quest to win gold for his dad. So Nick comes out to the course next day, does a few interviews with us. We get ready to start off. We start off the first two holes don't go really like we have anticipated our plan. So I finally tell Keith at the third hole, okay, Keith, we've got to just calm down. Let's say a little prayer here. Let's have fun, and let's just play a good round of golf. But you do have to realize, it was a cold, wet, and windy, and dreary day. So it's a nasty day. We go through hole three, four, five, playing okay. We get to hole six, and I would call it what I would call a blow up. Because in unified golf, the most you can get is 10. We get a 10 on that hole. And I think that really kind of blows our chances for having that gold, um, doing what we really wanted. We're driving the hole number seven, and the air horn goes off, and they're calling us into the clubhouse because it was raining so hard. And I was like, it's about time. Um, but really, it wasn't the time now because we needed to play some more after just getting a 10. But we get called into the clubhouse. We sit there and wait for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, and they decide to finally call it. But during that time, Nick comes up to me and he says, he's talking and making general um, conversation. And he says, man, it'd sure be good if you all win the gold medal. It'd make a great story. I look Nick straight in the eye and I said, Nick, if I was you, I'd get a new storyline, buddy. <laughs> we better find something new. So they decided to call the round and they call us and we couldn't go anywhere because the clubhouse was so full. So they had people just stand where they were and they called out the divisions. Our division was up and I knew who was in that because I looked up on the board. So I seen our division when we got called, I was pleasantly surprised when we weren't called for the bronze. And then they called the silver medalist and it wasn't us either. And then they say, the gold medalist today, playing in honor of his dad, Keith Lookinoff and his golf partner Gary winning the gold medal. Keith comes up to me, gives me a big hug, and says, Gary, I think my dad would be proud of me. I said, Keith, I know your dad is, and I think he was our angel today out on the course, my friend. And what a great pleasure it was. Because I really think what happened that day is God decided to let one of his angels help one of his earthly angels shine brightly that day. So I want you to think about your relationships. I want you to think about your top five personal relationships and top five professional relationships. Are you a giver or a taker in those relationships? And I believe you can be some of both because a giver is a person that gives of themselves, but sometimes we take from our relationships things that we need to take from the others. So what are you in those relationships? I want you to think about that for a minute and I want you to share with someone next to you Three things about yourself, about yourself that is different. And whatever you think it is, but I'm gonna give you an example. Like I'll give you an example. My son Chris is in Columbia, South America right now on Rotary Exchange. Um, I wrote, have written three books now and I love to snow ski. I want you to share with someone next to you three things that they may not know about you. Go ahead and share for a minute. Share. Okay, hopefully you found out something about that other person, maybe something you didn't know, because I hear some pretty good laughs out there, so that's good, but something that you find out about that person. 
I believe you can be a giver and taker in your relationships because that's what we are allowed to do. I read an article in Guidepost magazine that talked about Danny Thomas, the founder of St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And he says you can be a giver and a taker. But his belief is the takers may eat better, but the givers sleep better. So think about that. How can we give in our relationships? What can we do? What's that action that you can do in each one of those relationships that will make a difference? We can give and we can take in those relationships. Now, practice one was energy. Practice two that we talked about was our connections, our relationships that we have with others. Practice three is all about the influence that you show. What is the influence that you show with yourself in those areas? So I need some help here because I need a big, strong guy here and stuff on that side. A big, strong guy somewhere out there in the crowd that's willing to volunteer. Did I see you volunteer, this guy in the green there? Did I see that? Did you say yes? Didn't you all see him volunteer? Give him a hand! I saw him volunteer! Now, I need one more. Come on up the steps here. I need one more volunteer. One more volunteer. Ma'am, in, there in the blank, did I see you say yes? Yeah, I thought I saw you say yes. I did too. Come on up. Give her a hand. Give her a hand. Right here in the center, sir. Thank you for volunteering. And your name? Keith Hinky. Look at that. This is Keith Hinky, y'all. Okay. And here comes Susan Stegman. Let's give her a nice hand. Thank you for volunteering. Way to go. <laughs> okay, Keith, you're here. You're right here in the middle. You're going to get to show how strong you are. Now remember, I have been pumping iron. I told you all that. I pumped iron today, asked Nick, and I was working on the arms, so you may be in trouble now. Now here's your job, is all you have to do is put out your arms like this, and I'm testing your manhood. You're not allowed to allow me to push those down. All right. Now your job is to make sure he's doing what he's supposed to right now. You'll have something else here in a minute, okay? So I'm gonna try to push him down, but don't allow me to do it, okay? Right. You ready? Right. Set, go! <laughs> Ding! He is kind of strong. <laughs> I didn't pick a weakling, don't I? Now, Susan, you come here right in the middle. I want you to look him straight in the eye. Now, Keith, I want you to know she's going to tell you all false things about you. All right. But she's going to tell you things she don't like. Sorry. But they're all going to be false, so don't worry. But she's going to tell you things that she doesn't like. All right. Okay? But don't worry. They're false. But remember. She's going to tell you things you don't like, okay? So for 30 seconds, I need you to look him in the eye and tell him things you don't like. I really don't like your glasses, oh. and I think you're really mean to people. You should volunteer more often because they really count on you for that, and the shirt color doesn't bring out your color. <laughs> like you should do something like more of like red and different things, and your ears are kind of like out. <laughs> <laughs> and our shoes, I mean, really, could you have cleaned them up a little and stuff? Like, you know, really? And the jeans? You probably had those for a while. I like your hair and stuff. Maybe, like, you could wash that a little bit more often. Receding hairline? Yeah, probably. Um, yes, for sure. Uh, it's, yeah, it's tough. And I don't know, this, the style of the shirts I'm now wearing collars up and stuff. So Pretty big cool. nose, too. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. let's see what we did. Put your arms back out. I'll let you scoot over. Don't let me push him down. Ready? No, come on. You're not even trying. Come on. Are you cheating? Want to try one more time? Hmm. Okay, Susan, tell him all the things we love about this guy. I love that I'm looking straight at you. Your perfect posture and that color brings out the roses and your cheeks. And the glasses are very cool, actually. I really like the glasses a lot. And you look like you're getting some good uh, sun already for this mm. brain that we have right now. Thank you. Yeah, it's really awesome. And I love the shoes, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that color good on him? The color, color just it. fits it perfect, out. yeah. Exactly. Brings out awesome. that complexion. And I love your hair, too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the height and the ear. I look, look straight at you, mm -hmm. so it's like nice to have a tall person to have a conversation with. So it's right. pretty cool. Thank you. 
Okay. Let's try one more time. All right. Now, come on. <laughs> come on, let's try one more time. Give my hand. Now, why they're up here, let me say. You see how our mindset is so strong? It's positive or negative. When we're talking about influence, it's the only time in leadership that you can show the negative side. You can really show your negative side by the words that you use. Were you trying to hold your arms up the first time when I couldn't pull them down? I was. Were you trying when for 30 seconds or whatever time it was, she told you all those false things about you? I was. <laughs> you saw what the power of those words are. See how powerful our words are and our actions? I've done this hundreds of times with audience. I've only had one time an individual could block it completely out. See how strong our mindset is? When we believe we can, we can. So the question is, in influence, who are we influencing with our words and actions each and every day? Let's give our two volunteers a hand. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for doing it. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Susan's up here apologizing to him. Yeah. I told him they were false. See how powerful our words are? So what I want you to take from this, in your relationships, if you want to influence others, what is the positiveness that you are giving to those individuals? You can be that powerful, positive influence. And our words do matter, as you saw just from that brief exercise. So what's that positiveness that you give? Each and every day, I think it's so important that we really change our wording. Because our wording really sets us up for success or failure. I have a saying, and my kids are in the audience, and they'll tell you they hear it all the time. Before I leave them, in the morning, if I'm there when they head off to school, I tell them to make it a great day. I don't say this, have a nice day. Because have a nice day means what? Not very powerful in the words, not very positive. But when you say make it a great day, who has that choice? They get to make that choice. And we each get that choice each and every day as we go forward. So in practice three, when you look at your influence, how are you being positive in your actions and in your words that you share each and every day? Now let's look at practice four. Practice four is all about integration. So it's the changes and the habits and disciplines we wanna create in our life each and every day. So we have to look at that what changes do we need to make and then how do we go forward in making that? Let me give you an example. Charles Duhigg wrote a book called The Power of Habit. And in his book, he talks about the cue, the routine, and the reward. The cue is kind of that mental trigger that when you start a habit, it almost makes you automatically go into that. And then the routine is, once you create a routine of it, like if it's exercise or if it's brushing your teeth, you get into that routine, you just automatically do it. I always tell people, think about in the morning, how do you get ready to leave? I would bet 99% of us do it the same each and every day. I'm the type that I've got to brush my teeth first, then I've got to shave, and then I've got to take a shower. Some people it may be take their shower, brush their teeth, then get ready to go. We all become different, but I guarantee you, think about it. How many of us can think now that we do it the same each and every day? That's a habit because it becomes that routine. Let me share you with you one of my habits. One of my habits is I get up and have a magic morning routine that I try to do most mornings. And what I do is I get up at 4.50 a.m. Yes, really, 4.50 a.m. And I get up, I wash my face, I drink two glasses of water to energize my brain, and then I go in, I do some reading, reflecting, and journaling. And it allows me that time then, that's my cue to get up where I go, what I do each and every day. And then my routine is doing the reading, reflecting, and journal. And then from there, it gives me that reward of a spiritual, emotional, and social vibrance. 
kind of charging my battery. Remember what we talked about earlier? It allows my battery to be charged up for the rest of the day. So what's your cue, what's your routine, and then what's your reward on the habits that you want to create? Jerry Seinfeld was asked by a young comedian one time how he became such a great comedian. And Jerry Seinfeld told him, you must write material each and every day. And Jerry decided to make it a game of it. So what he did is he put up 100 squares on the wall. And each day, as he wrote, he would mark with a big red marker in red that he wrote that day. And then the next day he did it, he did it again. And he told the young comedian, he said, once you start a chain, don't break it. So if you did, he told you then you had to start over and start with a new marker color and do it again. And he had 100 squares on that. I've created a system called the Habit Maker that when I want to create a new habit, I don't do it on a wall, but I've got a piece of paper and I put that habit on and I keep track of it each day till it becomes a habit. My newest habit is, as of April 1, I've started writing, journaling again. I was not journaling as much as I wanted to, so I'm now journaling every day. And I'm trying to create that to become my habit over the next 90 to 100 days, but to do it daily each and every day. So what habit do you want to change? What habit do you want to create and make for your life? That's what the power of habits will do for you. Everybody stand up if you would. We're going to get you moving again. <clears throat> this game is not Simon Says, but I do need you to repeat after me. We're going to spell, hopefully most of you spell, but if not, I'll tell you, we're going to spell charge. So what I need you to do, I need you to do it well because this guy is filming you, okay? So we've got to be loud. I want you to use your arms. And I want you, when I say give me a C, you're going to give me a C and then an H and we'll go forward, okay? Ready? <laughs> Give me a C. C. Give me an H. H. Give me an A. H. Give me an R. R. Give me a G. G. Give me an E. E. What's it spell? Star. What's it spell? Star. What's it spell? Star. All right. You can have a seat. Charge for me is a life sentence acronym kind of mantra for myself. Create habits around real goals every day. Create habits around real goals every day. I have a wristband. There's some out there. And if anybody wants one, we'll give you one when you walk out. You can have one. The wristbands are right there. But charge each and every day for what you want. I think that's really the key. When we look at, when we're looking at our life, what do we want to create? It's about the goals that we set. And then it's about charging forward to go out there and reach them. Now, I want to share with you. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we think about those framework of the four practices, I want to cover those one more time so we don't forget what they were. Can anybody tell me what was the first practice? George, do you get it? Charge. No, what was the first practice that we talked about? What was the first thing we talked about? What was the first practice? Anybody got it? Energy. Energy had two parts, right? What was the first part of energy? Exercise. That's right. The second part was all about what? Being productive. Being productive. Productivity. Okay? So that's energy. Practice one. Practice two was what? It was all about our connections, right? It's about our relationships. Are we a giver or a taker in those relationships? And our third practice was our influence that we saw. And what did we see there? Our influence is either positive or negative. And it's shown by our actions and by our words that we use each and every day. And the last habit is not habits, it's actually integration. What do we need to integrate into our life to create that change to get the habits and disciplines that we want each and every day? Because when we create that charge, we allow to, ourselves to move forward. Now, in 1991, there was a gentleman by the name of Mark Musso with Special Olympics Missouri that was just coming here to become the CEO and president of Special Olympics Missouri. And he walked into my office 
to get a Novatel install phone installed in his vehicle. That was back in the days when you installed them. For anybody that don't remember that, you actually installed them at that time. So we installed that phone and he told me what he did. Up till May of 1994, he kept trying to get me to attend a, a Special Olympics Games. And finally, I said in May of 1994, I drove to Fort Leonard Wood and I decided to go down there. I'll have to admit, part of it was business and part of it was to go down there for the games. We were thinking about opening a store in the area and I thought I could do two things at once. So I go to that opening ceremonies that night and the soldiers were cheering for the athletes each and every time as they paraded in for what they called the Parade of Athletes. And it kind of was like the opening ceremonies of an Olympics. People, they were clapping and cheering. The soldiers were yelling at the top of their lungs as the athletes were walking in. I'll never forget an athlete came up. He did the athlete's oath and said, let me win, but if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. And then the rest of the opening ceremonies went on. And at the end of the ceremonies, they always light the cauldron. It's kind of the flame of hope for Special Olympics. And there's always an athlete and a law enforcement officer that light that cauldron together. And when they lit that cauldron, the crowd went wild. And I actually felt hair on my arm stand up. I didn't know it at the time. But that night changed my life. It was one of those moments that I'll never forget now. Because that night, I realized that that was a movement that I could become part of. We come back, we start getting our teams involved in raising money for the athletes. We started doing the polar plunges, freezing, jumping in freezing cold water, started repelling off buildings, started doing raffles and fundraisers in our businesses and started creating a culture within our company of that we wanted to give the, something back to the athletes. And I think all along we got more in return. But it became a pleasure sharing that with our team and making that difference and seeing them light up. As all that was ending, and at one point, it really made me realize the culture that we were able to create. And it really didn't come from me, it came from our team. Because what happened is then when they started volunteering at games, they wanted to do more for the athletes and they wanted to keep doing it. So we kept doing different things and kept raising it up. And I was always impressed because our team members got involved and wanted to be a part of that. But they always felt like the athletes gave them so much more back in return. So when we start to give of ourselves, we start to see we get more in return the other way. But that night it really realized to me that that changed my life. And it really brought me back to that question that Sister Teresa asked me. Sister Teresa said, Gary, when I was that lost seventh grade boy, what is your purpose of your life? I think I have my answer now. Sister Teresa, my purpose of my life is to be a servant leader, to show my love and relationships that I love each and every day, how I can help those relationships to give of themselves freely, love openly, and make a difference in the world. I believe we all have that capability in ourselves. I want you to go out and charge and create habits around real goals every day to do what you want to be passionate about in life and give it to others. Because when we give of ourselves, we get so much more in return. It leaves you with a quote that I want to share with you. And this quote is, I coined a few years back, it's your life. Why not live the life you want to live? It's better than letting someone else choose how you should live. So go out each and every day and charge and make it a great day. And thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here tonight.